Welcome to the, the um, panel on identity threat and cybersecurity. My name is Masako Fiddler from Slavic Studies, and I will be uh, kind of moderating the discussions. Um, and uh, uh, this, uh, this is on uh, identity threat and the cybersecurity. And at the same time, it's, it's about the Czech language and identity in the glo globalizing world. Um, we really appreciate your physically coming to this pa panel in spite of the weather and falling trees. <laughs> uh, we appreciate it. Uh, we would also like to extend our welcome to the audience who are watching us through the webcast from different places of the world, especially Lucia Hindusova. Uh, I think, uh, Lucia, you probably are there, for uh, the Deputy General Counsel of the Czech Republic in New York and perhaps uh, Mr. Kuresh, the General Counsel of the Czech Republic in New York. Thank you for your support. Um, before starting this event, I wanted to talk about our motivations behind the event. Uh, first, we would like to present the relevance of the Czech Republic with respect to identity and security. This will be addressed in more detail by Václav Svrček. Um, uh, identity is also a key moment in language diaspora. Uh, about about which Lida Cope, Cope is going to talk um, and discussing in, in migration. It is also important for us to hold this event very close to the foundation of the Republic Day, uh, which is October the 28th, tomorrow. Um, second, we wanted to uh, put linguistics on a map when talking about global issues. Linguistic analysis of texts and speech has not been um, in my view, noted very well. Um, it is also because linguists might be working in a bubble, but I'm hoping that this panel will start our continu continuous discussion uh, between uh, linguists and historians in security studies. Um, I must also acknowledge our uh, gratitude to many people and institutions uh, outside and inside of Brown that helped uh, put together this panel. Uh, first and, and foremost, to the General Consulate of the Czech Republic in New York, uh, the Czech Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and the Brown Office of Global Engagement. Um, uh, this, was, this event was actually funded by these two, uh, two um, uh, units. Um, also, the event was also made possible thanks to the Memorandum of Understanding between Brown University and Charles University in Prague. Uh, we would also like to thank the Watson Institute and the Department of Slavic Studies for co-sponsoring the event. Um, let me introduce the speakers and, and discuss this very briefly. Uh, Professor Lida Cope, sociolinguist at East Carolina University, there. Um, uh, she has been heavily involved in language documentations and she works with Robert Dittman from Charles University and the Czech National Corpus uh, at Charles University. So, so uh, Professor Kolb is also related to Charles University. Professor Vasa Svrček is a corpus linguist, discourse and analyst, um, and, and does many things at Charles University in the Czech Republic. He's a longtime research, research collaborator for me. And Professor Ivan Araguentoft is from the Watson Institute. Um, his expertise is in cybersecurity, and we're looking forward to discussions and lively discussions. Uh, Professor Holy Case is, is sitting there, um, is from the Department of History and specializing in modern Europe um, and the relationship between foreign policy, social, social policy, so science, and literature. Um, both professors work with members of Charles University um, uh, uh, under the auspices of our memorandum. So we'll start with the, with the two talks first. Um, uh, and then this will be followed by questions and comments by the discussants. And then we'll open up and take questions from the floor. And I will uh, keep an eye on the YouTube live streaming where some, stu some, some questions might, uh, not, might pop up. So um, I'll be very quick and we would like to welcome first the Professor Vasa Svrček. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for having me, and um, thank you, Marco, for organizing this event. Um, 
um, I'm, I'll be actively drinking from time to time so that you can see my face, like, like now. So. Okay, so I'm going to talk about, um, or the title of my talk is Disinformation in Cyberspace, and uh, you can think of many cyber threats, like, you know, malware, spyware, identity theft, and distributed in our service attacks, and so on, but I won't talk about that. A, because I'm not a cyber expert or computer science uh, expert, and B, because uh, I think there, are, there is a difference between these types of cyber uh, attacks and disinformation campaigns on which I will focus mostly in my talk. The greatest difference, at least for me, is that uh, these are mo more or less uh, one-time uh, attacks uh, targeting individuals or institutions Whereas disinformation campaigns are in its own, uh, like uh, from, from, from their own nature, like are long-term activities to induce chaos in the target state. So that's something different. And also there are other things, but uh, we usually frame uh, these activities into a term like hybrid warfare. And I will focus mainly on hybrid warfare in the Czech Republic. Now, hi uh, hybrid warfare is, by definition, using a wide range of nonviolent actions to create chaos into targets, target state. Sorry, uh, so it's like something like hoaxes, disinformation, and there is sometimes a difference or distinction between hoaxes, which is something which is false, and uh, disinformation, which is also a false information, but also with the intention to harm, and malinformation, which is only to make uh, someone feeling bad. And if you combine all those things together, or many, uh, many hoaxes together, disinformation, you get a conspiracy theory, which, uh, in a way, represents a way how to look at and explain the world around us. And so, uh, if uh, you think about these phenomena, they are all text-based. So it calls for linguistic analysis, and in a sense, this is a an opportunity for us. I mean, those who are embedded in humanities, because if it is a war, and in a sense it is, uh, and if it is uh, words which are used instead of bullets, then you know it makes sense to consult it with people from uh, the humanities, because reading texts and interpreting text is uh, something which is in the very core of our mission as, as people from humanities. So it makes sense to look at it from the perspective of historian, literary studies, and linguist. That, that's my field from, uh, from where I come. And uh, I would also like to show you that it makes sense, even though you do not know anything about Czech or Czech Republic, to look at specifically at the Czech situation, because uh, Czech situation is unique in a sense that it's on the border of the former East, uh, Eastern Bloc, as you can see. And uh, due to that, uh, it is still, uh, or appears to be, according to our intelligence services, a strategic lo location for intense Russian intelligence uh, and Chinese intelligence activities. So, in a sense, the Czech case uh, is a unique case, not only for that reason, but also because uh, Czech has uh, quite uh, an advanced resources for this type of analysis, as you can, uh, uh, as you'll find out later on. Uh, what I'm going to talk about are anti-system web portals. Uh, I will not give you a definition. What do I mean by anti-system web portals? But we know from our intelligence services or Ministry of Interior or other non-profit organizations such as Endowment Fund of uh, uh, Independent Journalism that these portals are characteristic for spreading disinformation and pro-Russian propaganda. Uh, they usually do not have clear ownership. Uh, they usually do not uh, provide us with the names of the authors or the editorial team is unknown. And sources are often missing or are irrelevant in, in the news. So these are the characteristic features you can Google if you, if you, if you Google just you know, the, the term anti-system web portals. But uh, it is not something, uh, it is not a definition which can be actually operationalized. 
to harvest the texts which are interesting for us in this in this analysis. So we have to uh, um, start with the data, I assume. Uh, what I would like to uh, show you now is a unique project, which is uh, the, the latest uh, project of the Czech National Corpus. Uh, and it's called Corpus Online. And it's a uh, uh, large uh, database of texts uh, which aims to monitor or map the dynamic content of Czech internet. And it contains online media from all sources, not just, you know, those entire system, but also mainstream media. It also contains discussion forums, internet, and so on, internet forums, or some social networks, such as Facebook and Twitter, but, uh, you know, Facebook changed the policies quite recently, so we have to skip this and it covers the whole uh, the quite large range of uh, of of uh, dates so it's from february 2017 till the march now we are experiencing some kind of hiatus in 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 the coverage but hopefully we will be able to uh, find a new or we did already find a new data provider so we will keep on and and uh, keep on with the coverage now uh, if you can imagine a, a database of texts which is updated on a daily basis so uh, there are 4.5 million words each day from all sources of the Czech internet. And it provides you with the opportunity to sit with your morning coffee and to look for the yesterday's agenda and find out how it was, uh, how it was portrayed or framed in different parts of, of uh, uh, online media. It comes with some annotation, which is technical stuff, and I would not bother you with that. Uh, the important thing here is uh, that it comes also um, with uh, some sort of a classification of sources. And this classification or the media typology we used is based on a, similar a similarity of audiences. This is, this is really important and I would say quite innovative approach to this. It, it's based on a research done by Josef Schlerka and his team. And what he did is that he combined three types of information. He combined the, the information about how the web portals are interlinked. Uh, what are the visitors of the websites, which is uh, uh, informa information which is accessible via Alexa rank um, service, and also and that's the most important part. He also combines the information about who shares and likes the content. So he was able to cluster the media portals according to the fact that uh, they are read by similar people, not by some linguistic characteristics, not by a political stance, but just simply by the fact that they are read by the similar segment of the population. So. Uh, what he uh, does is this kind of networks. This is one way how to look at the data. There are lots of them. And he comes, uh, out, uh, comes up with a set of clusters, which can be labeled A, B, C, or 1, 2, 3. But you know, it would not be convenient to work with these labels. So uh, we labeled them according to a prototype, um, prototype portal. So there are mainstream media or types of different types of ma mainstream media, and there are anti-system media, which can be then later uh, characterized by some political stance, so, such as they are pro-Kremlin, anti-EU, anti-NATO, anti-establishment, and so on. Uh, they are also characterized by fast cloning of texts. Uh, that's a practice which is uh, quite uh, massively used by um, anti-system media that uh, one um, portal produces a text. Uh, often it is a translation from an e English source. And then uh, the text is um, cloned by other anti-system portals. And they also are, uh, they can be characterized by something which is inauthentic coordinated sharing. So um, you can calculate uh, on social networks what is the uh, time span between sharing of one story uh, on Facebook, for example, and then you can compare it 
for different different contents. Uh, um, colleagues uh, of Josef Schlerka did this for these anti-system uh, portals and find out that the, 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 the span between individual sharing is uh, uh, uniquely uh, short. So it is a hint that there is some coordination going on. And uh, so it may be um, coordinated by someone. We don't know. Uh, so uh, what I'm going to talk about is uh, linguistic analysis of these anti-system web portals. And I would like to focus on three things. First of all, we can look at what topics is uh, um, in the focus of, of anti-system media that shows us something about the ideological partiality of, of, the, uh, of the portal. We can look at specific agenda, if there is any. So uh, we, can, we can look at whether uh, they spread actually some disinformation and conspiracies and what are they. And we can also look, and that's the most interesting part for me, uh, the discourse spins. The fact that they actually evaluate things differently. They making spins and, and sometimes they reframe events differently. So that's uh, something I would like to focus on in this talk. But that's not what I did by myself. It's a long term collaboration with Marco Fiedler. Usually with this slide, I have a little photo here. But since Marco's here, you can look at it. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, no, it's, it's, it's not just my work, and if you find anything really brilliant, it's uh, often Marco's idea. <laughs> so, um, how do we do it? Um, uh, what we do with the text is that we harvest keywords out of them, and uh, that's a quite common analytical technique used by corpus linguists. It basically does a simple thing. Uh, it calculates the frequency, the number of occurrences of words in a text and compare the frequency of the word with the, the frequency the word has in a general reference corpus. So what we are uh, looking for here is words which are overrepresented by the text. And these keywords uh, usually tell us something about the topic of the text. Sometimes they also refer to genre or register. But um, if you carefully select a reference corpus, which is of the same, if it is, uh, the ref if the reference corpus is of, is of the same register as the target text you're analyzing, then, you know, this influence uh, is leveled out and uh, what you get is just, you know, the topics. And that's uh, what we, what we that's where our interpretation starts. Uh, these keywords, as Mike Scott, who coined this method in, in um, 2006, uh, has said, keywords are just pointers. They do not give you the whole story, the whole interpretation. You have to look it up, uh, uh, look the, the word up in the text and find out how it actually is used in the text and find out what role it plays in the discourse. But they are the, you know, uh, nice starting points in the analysis. Now, uh, if we uh, look at keywords in anti-system and mainstream media in the period of from October 2017 to October 2018, and compare it with a general reference corpus of checks in 2015, uh, we'll find out in the mainstream uh, like these words, according to president government, say Babish, that's the name of our uh, former prime minister, election court party, Zeman, that's the name of our president, chairman. Uh, these are, you know, the, the, this is the normal domestic political agenda you'll find out. There's also the according to, which is a word which is often used in, in the newspaper discourse because they, they want to, to uh, you know, acknowledge their sources. And if you look at anti-system, you'll get quite different view. Um, so the topics most interesting for anti-system is Russia, USA, President, Russian, American, government, political, war, country, EU. Uh, so uh, in, you, you do not have to go any deeper to, to find out that there is a, something going on, that there is a difference, definitely, and uh, that anti-system media tend to deal with specific aspects of international events. They are not interested in domestic events. You, for example, um, you will not find, you know, weather forecast in anti-system media or 
you know, results of football match. Uh, so uh, they are interested in geopolitical events and especially in the main players, the superpowers, so to say. Uh, but Russia is also, of course, it's not in the top 10, but Russia is also a topic for mainstream. So if we look at those topics which are really, really unique to anti-system, which, which do not appear in the mainstream media, it's this list. It's, it's a sample only, but uh, to give you a, uh, some impression. Uh, so Anglo-Zionist, apostate, that's, that's a key word which actually refers to Pope Francis, which is perceived as heretic and apostate. Russia gate that's that's a word word related to the uh, Russian collusion in US election Amy Havelish pejorative word dollarization judeo masonic armageddon something like uh, reference to nuclear armageddon anti russian anti russian stents are often explicitly uh, explicitly uh, explicit here in in anti system so these are the topics which are interesting for anti-system media and we can harvest those topics by quantitative uh, quantitative uh, methods now we will not focus further on these things rather we would like to or we did we focus on uh, the association among topics so one thing to look at anti-system media is to look at what interests them the other thing is what are the uh, uh, what are the uh, concepts of shared interest by mainstream and anti-system and how differently they frame the same event now um, for this purpose we adopted this method you know from shopping online um, uh, it's called market basket analysis and what it does is is sifts through lots of um, uh, transactions to find out what people buy buy together so it in a in a sense tries to find out if there is an association between between items in 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 the market basket and shopping cart and it gives you these you know suggestions um, if we apply this method this text mining or data mining method to texts, it may look like this. So we take each individual text, identify keywords within, within each individual text, and we, we look for systematic associations between keywords, between topics. And these do not have to be necessarily adjacent. It does not have to be like, you know, uh, Soviet Union, like two words uh, uh, in, a, in a close context. These can be two topics which are really far from, from each other in the text, but they systematically appear. Now, uh, market basket analysis uh, gives us uh, um, the, the, the result of market basket analysis is associative link, which is the form of antecedent and consequent and can be read like, for example, if the text contain word A, B, C, it will most probably contain also the word D and so on. Uh, this gives us the information about uh, how individual words are used in which context and most importantly, which topics actually correlate. And this can be also evaluated by, by some variables such as support, confidence and lift, which uh, out of them lift is the most important one and gives us the information about the strength of the association. Uh, so for example, uh, if we take the word migrant in Czech, migrant in English and uh, if we uh, look at associative links with this word in anti-system uh, in the period from June to September 2020 you'll find out that there are words such as illegal asylum country European migration European border and so on so these are the topics which are associated with the word keyword migrant uh, sometimes we found out that we found out that sometimes it is um, more convenient to work uh, with uh, associative arrays. So uh, we take all the words related to a word, for example, the word migrant, 
and create an associative re array a list of all associated words and uh, we analyze this array because this array in a sense is the frame the discursive frame of the migrant in anti-system this associative array is then compared with a similar array of the same word in mainstream and the analysis comes out of this comparison now uh, i will like to show you three strategies uh, of anti-system hopefully i have time still some time and um, uh, first of them uh, we call the first of them zone flooding and it's called uh, uh, in inspiration to this quote by steve bannon and in a sense he was right because that's actually what the anti-system does and uh, if we stick to the word migrant and if we look at uh, how much attention it was it draw uh, in different main uh, in different media segments you'll get this picture so uh, there are oh, good. okay yeah, it works uh, there are uh, i don't know 250 uh, uh, texts in mainstream media which has migrant as a keyword apart from uh, or uh, against uh, almost 500 text in anti-system so um, anti-system focuses more on migration but uh, if you look at uh, the relative numbers it's even you know it's not twice but it's three times more that's one piece of information let's keep it but uh, the uh, the zone flooding comes here if we look at links in which migrant is involved you'll find out that there is a difference uh, uh, it's, it's a factor of six or seven. There are far more associations related to migrant in anti-system than it is in mainstream. And the average or median strength of each individual link is stronger in the mainstream while very weak or somewhat weak in the anti-system. So uh, this, this pattern may be you know, regarded as flooding uh, because um, uh, the anti-system uh, tries to connect the topic of migration with many other topics which can potentially uh, be um, perceived as, uh, you know, um, uh, as something dividing the, the, the society apart. Uh, so uh, it might piggyback on topic on the topic of migration to expound other topics such as Islamization of Europe, racism, conspiracies about NGOs, the EO in disarray and its uh, uh, damaging influence um, on Czechia staple themes that appear in the anti-system as general. If you look at if you look at the associations themselves, uh, you'll find out that the mainstream associations are like, you know, something which refers to the actual situation of migrants or that migration is a <coughs> challenge to EU. So both and Italy, these two keywords refer to the actual embarkment of, of, uh, of uh, migrants in that time. Whereas anti-system has many, many other associations uh, and I can give you some some quotations. For example, the Hungary. Uh, this is quotation from 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 uh, one story of anti-system media. Um, the Czech, the, sorry, the Czech government and the prime minister, wherever he goes, he claims that the Czech migration politics is identical to the Hungarian approach in this area. Why then is he taking his time and not taking action? So. Uh, that's that's one one um, one topic or one line of uh, reasoning that we are not as strong as Hungary in in you know opposing the EU policies, uh, illegal Africa and so on uh, pictures a migrant or creates the negative image of migrants and stereotypization, EU member our country. Uh, it's also an argument that leads to the fact that EU is actually a responsible for migration and the only way how to deal it, with it is uh, that Czech Republic should exit EU, global, UN, NGO, that's, that's you know, another quote. Uh, 
European Union cannot be reformed. The EU's bureaucratic apparatus cannot be replaced. The EU is still on its migration plans and the UN's migration plans. Step by step, the EU is implementing, organizing and generously supporting these plans. So these are the, 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 the major topics related to migration. Now, second strategy, completely different topic, completely different time. Uh, and now it's about vaccine and about how the vaccine is portrayed in anti-system media. We look at uh, three periods of time, summer, uh, autumn and winter of 2020-21. And the, the chart shows a number of associated words basically with the word vaccine. And uh, the, the yellow ones are for mainstream, the red ones are associations specific for anti-system. And the orange ones are those which are shared by those two segments. As you can see, uh, at first it is primarily a topic for mainstream media and all the mainstream associations go from uh, the period one to the period one. So the anti-system actually accepts all the associations in the mainstream. Now, if you go uh, the next step uh, from the second period to the third, you'll find out again that all the mainstream associations are shared. That means that mainstream um, donates or <laughs> no, uh, anti-system accepts all the uh, mainstream associations and is also capable of injecting some of its own to the shared discourse. So in a way, it is parasitic on, on the mainstream topic because at first, it was not a topic at all for anti-system media. If you look at what are the, uh, uh, the, the topics that migrate, the, the migration from main mainstream and, uh, to anti-system, these are all topics which are related to the you know, agenda of vaccination and testing and so on. On the other hand, if you look at what uh, the anti-system contribution to the common discourse about vaccination, you find out that there is this Cold War topic, uh, there is also the discussion about immunity, whether it actually gets help after vaccination and so on. Primula, that's the, the, the Ministry of Health, Minister of Health in that time. And most importantly, Sputnik, Sputnik V, that's the uh, Russian uh, vaccination, uh, the Russian vaccine. Uh, what it does is that, um, uh, what, what anti-system does here is that he prepares the discourse for the discussion about accepting Russian um, vaccination, Sputnik, which was then boosted by Czech president who actually started the discussion uh, later on, but uh, the, the, the vaccine was not accepted. But anyway, uh, they at least tried. Um, the, at the same time, mainstream and anti-system keep their own specific association. Again, with mainstream, these are like completely normal and organic, you know, topics related to vaccinations, just number percent, Monday, Tuesday, and so on, how it, well, how it went. Uh, the, what is specific for anti-system is a suggestion that there is some, so, some sort of pharmaceutical lobby or pharmaceutical conspiracy in which Bill Gates is involved, an army and so on. And the other topic is, or Brussels of course, uh, the other topic is uh, the right uh, or the infringement of rights and, and uh, you know, the, 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 the necessity to wear mask and if it is actually something that is in conflict with our uh, civil rights. So these are the topics uh, which um, anti-system was not capable injecting to the general discourse. Um, framing events uh, is in general something that um, different contexts, uh, different concepts get into different contexts. So if you look at those, you know, key terms of, of the political debate of uh, last summer, it's EU or European Union in which mainstream plays normal role and it's mainstream is mainly interested in Czech negotiations with EU. So Babish, name of the Czech Prime Minister, Czechia, European Prime Minister, government country. These are completely, you know, uh, normal topics you would expect to be related with the topic of EU. Whereas anti-system uh, draws a different picture. Uh, it shows us that um, uh, EU in relation to Russia and sanctions, 
supposedly that's an important word because it 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 you know um, it uh, framed the EU as as deceptive because something supposedly should be and, and it was not, and it also um, uh, it also uh, creates the picture that uh, EU threats uh, our. Uh, national sovereignty and self-sufficiency. So that's an, also another, another, another thing. Um, in the case of Russia, uh, there is a completely different picture. Mainstream looks at Russia in this particular time frame, in r respect with two topics. First is COVID, and the second one is Belarusian uh, protests. Uh, these are two things which are mainly concerned by, by you know, mainstream media, whereas anti-system, again, draws a different picture because um, anti-system uh, associations suggest Russia plays a significant role in international scenes. There are the names of the countries and uh, uh, there's a, the context of security and conflicts and so on. So the, the picture of Russia is as... Uh, as a superpower playing a uh, positive international role and leadership in the world. Um, do I have still time? Uh, five, minutes. five minutes? Oh, yeah, that's, that's exactly what I need. Uh, last thing I would like to show you is um, um, the last attempt on analyzing the discourse using the time information. And we call this approach uh, poetically companions. And um, companions like two words traveling in time. So th that, that's, that's where the picture comes from. And uh, what we do with companions is that we want to look at frequency development through time of different con uh, concepts and find out if they correlate or not. And if they correlate in the same time, it means that they actually reflect the same thing. So let's look at uh, how... Uh, what, uh, about how, uh, let's look at companions of COVID and flu. So the question is, is COVID just a flu? And now we look at the text in the corpus through time and calculate number of occurrences in individual days. And we can draw these lines. The, the red one is for chrypka, that's Czech word for flu. The bluish one is for coronavirus or COVID. Uh, so, if you look at the mainstream media, you'll find out that the correlation uh, minus 0 0.04 is virtually non-existent. There is no correlation at all. So, these two topics are not related in time. Whereas, and I assume that you already know, uh, if you look at the anti-system media, the picture is quite different. In this period, we find very, very... Uh, high correlation of 0 0.92 and this actually shows us that at the beginning that's you know the february 2020 when the world was still innocent and no covid was uh, around uh, they were not interested in covid or flu at all but then uh, the, the you know the pandemic started in the czech republic and then also the discussions where the COVID is just a flu started in the uh, uh, anti-system media. Going back to the mainstream, you know, uh, in mainstream, there was this reporting about ongoing flu season as every year. Then uh, it dropped down and then the major topic became COVID and flu was, you know, uninteresting to almost everyone. So that's the difference, but, you know, anti-system does not care about flu because, as I said, you cannot find football results in anti-system. They do not care about topics unless they, uh, they can be used to some sort of um, geopolitical agenda. And then, then, then there is this correlation, nice correlation. Now, uh, to wrap it up, um, uh, I know, or we know, uh, that... Um, there is still a lot of research to be done because we still learn how to interpret the data and how to harvest the important ones from the text. But uh, we know that at least there are three systematic strategies which we found through a large period, uh, through a, some range of time, 
since you know the 2017 to uh, 2021 that these strategies systematically occur but we know that there may be some others as well um, as far as the the general message of the anti-system media portals is uh, there are some underlying ideological current and we can rephrase them or paraphrase them as follows. EU damaging the member states, especially Czechia, EU and NATO endangering Russia and inf interfering with other states. Russia is portrayed as a victim of this. Often, Russia is a superior superpower in technology as well as international politics and morals, and it can counter or help the Europe. Uh, other topic which uh, I did not focus on much but is also present there is that mainstream media cannot be trusted. And finally, the uh, Czech Republic is portrayed as dysfunctioning state and should strive for EU and NATO exit and turn to an alliance with Russia as a leading state. So these are the major um, ideological currents we found in, in the data. But we know that there are many more. There are also many more strategies. But um, what we really find in important here is that we can uh, identify those topics and strategies empirically, quantitatively, and identify that there are that they are systematically appearing in the text, not in one text, not in two texts, but throughout time. And that's you know uh, the point of my talk. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Jaroslav. Uh, uh, the next talk is, is by uh, Lida Kolb, uh, and I think we need to set it up, or do, do you have your... Yeah, okay. How much time do I have? <laughs> okay, all right. <laughs> That's what it looks like. Okay. Um, you can see it. You can see my wonderful checks. Hi. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Uh, uh, good afternoon. My talk today addresses language shift, loss, and identity in the Czech diaspora around the world. Um, in the first section, uh, the making of the Czech diaspora, I will focus on the 19th century emigration waves and the reason behind the exodus of emigrants from the Czech lands, particularly through the first decades of the 20th century. Also, I will briefly draw attention to the contemporary global communities of Czechs living abroad insofar as to accentuate their desire to raise Czech-speaking children and participate as Czech and global citizens in the Czech democracy. In the second section, uh, I draw on my work in Texas Czech communities to illustrate the effects of asymmetrical bilingualism on language change and loss and on the construction of identity in such language contact situations. As these processes are remarkably similar, this particular diasporic context will serve as a case study for our purposes today. I will close with a few observations on the catastrophic loss of the world's indigenous and minority languages, including those in the Czech diaspora. And because I know that we won't have time um, at the end, <laughs> I at least want to, uh, to discuss language documentation. I want to draw your attention to the logo for our Texas Czech Legacy Project and uh, invite you to visit so you can listen to the recordings of Texas Czech speech with transcripts and translations. Uh, first, let me briefly introduce the key processes and uh, terms in language contact shift and loss. So um, community language obsolescence and loss typically result from language shift, which occurs over the course of three to four generations in language contact situations where a smaller subordinate language uh, gradually succumbs to the socioeconomic, political, and cultural pressures arising from the long-lasting contact with the dominant language. 
Reversing language shift may be possible where community activists wish to work with linguists and language policy planners to document and possibly revitalize the shifting language. Gradual language loss, which best describes the types of context discussed today, is a process whereby the language's functional domain shrink and its structural properties change over time. The process of language attrition in these language context situations is accelerated by incomplete acquisition, where the home, school, and community link has weakened and where institutional support from the dominant society is lacking. Language loss has been a pressing issue for both indigenous and minority languages, including the Czech diaspora. So what is the Czech diaspora and what types of emigration led to its formation? Um, the term diaspora refers to Czech-speaking locations outside of the present-day territory of the Czech Republic, specifically the regions of Bohemia and Moravia. Some locations, such as those in Vienna and Upper Hungary, were formerly contained together with Czech lands within Austria and after 1867 were within Austro-Hungary. Others, such as those in uh, such as those in the Americas were created as new immigrants settled overseas. And I'm using here this wonderful map that we have of the Czech diaspora from Brocek 2003. Um, the Czech diaspora formation can be explained by three major types of emigration religious. That's from the mid 16th century until 1781. That's the issue of the patent of tolerance in Austria. Um, then uh, uh, the socioeconomic uh, migration, especially from the 1820s to 1938, and political uh, after 1848, uh, then especially between 1938, 1939, and after 1948 and 1968. They appear chronological, but may overlap. In fact, all three apply to the 19th century emigration, though the socioeconomic motivations uh, uh, were the main driving force then. Uh, poverty drove out many low-wage workers and farmers from the Czech regions of Austria as early as the 1820s and later Austro-Hungary, and then smaller numbers from Czechoslovakia between 1918 and 1938. The largest waves date back to around 1890 to 1910. Before World War I, most emigrants headed for the United States, the lower Austria, especially Vienna, Germany, Russia, and fewer moved to, for example, Romania, Serbia, and Bulgaria. The post-World War I recession stimulated emigration to other European countries, such as France and Belgium, and to South America, especially Argentina, during the interwar period. Whereas intergenerational economic prospects, increased mobility, and community permeability uh, accelerated the pace of assimilation in urban areas, such as St. Louis and Chicago, Vienna, Czech descendants with some ability in Czech can still be found among elders in many historically Czech rural communities, including those in Bosnia and Herzegovina, Croatia, Romania, Russia, Serbia, Ukraine, and the United States. Following the available estimates leads us to conclude that an overall total of emigrants from Bohemia and Moravia stood over at over 1.7 million before 1989, and is currently at about 2.5 million. Of this number, 1.2 million left to, due to economic reasons before 1914. The largest number of Czechs and Slovaks, about 1.6 million, lives in the United States. After both world wars, some European Czech diasporic communities experienced re-emigration, totaling more than 100,000 each, with a smaller re-emigration re re happening after the Velvet Revolution in 1989. So what are then the most notable historically Czech communities in the world? The mass pre-World War emigration and the post-war shifts of state structures resulted in a uh, paradoxical situation that, where by 1918, two out of the three largest Czech-speaking cities, that is Chicago and Vienna, lay abroad. In fact, in Vienna, if you can imagine, a quarter of the population was Czech by 1820. After Chicago, the two largest Czech-speaking cities were Cleveland and New York City. And uh, um, the, about New York City, I wanted to insert something. The longest-lived Czech newspaper, New York Scale Listy, published in New York City from 1874 till 1966, um, 
is connected with Svatava Pirkova Jakobsen, who is better known as the wife of the famous linguist, Roman Jakobsen. So allow me to insert my little advertisement here. Uh, I want to draw attention to Jakobsen's uh, wide-ranging uh, folkloric and uh, ethnographic uh, research in the Czech and Slovak community in New York City and then in Texas. Um, we have a, a large archive that's waiting to be cataloged and examined, and so we need help. <laughs> okay, moving on. Uh, key rural communities in the Czech diaspora in Europe and Asia include Bosnia and Herzegovina, Bulgaria, Croatia, Poland, uh, Romania, Russia, Serbia, and Ukraine. In South America, especially Argentina and Paraguay, and in North America, Canada and the United States. Um, there is research on all these communities, uh, though language is best examined for Vienna, Romania, Russia, and Volinian region in Uk Ukraine and Serbia, and that is not connected, Ukraine, Serbia, and the Darovar region in Croatia. Some recent work has been done on Czech in Paraguay, and there is a new thesis on Czech in uh, the Chaco province in Argentina, which is quite exciting because it's the only one, the first one that we have. I am not focusing on Australia, but also there, uh, also there we now have a study on Czech in southern Australia that was just published, but that's the post-1945 and 1970s emigration. The estimated 2.5 million then Czechs live you know, outside the Czech Republic today. Um, these include the new arrivals of 1989, estimated at 200,000 in 2007, as well as these descendants of Czechs in our historically Czech communities. There are at least 300 heritage organizations. A popular article on uh, E15CZ uh, uh, from uh, 2017 estimates that every sixth Czech currently lives abroad, and most of them in the United States. Here we see Czech heritage language programs uh, worldwide, in num worldwide in numbers based on the work of Martha uh, McCabe um, from 2017. These are either long established in uh, the traditionally Czech areas or recently started in the areas that have experienced an influx of uh, young professionals living in the US temporarily or long term. Uh, the most recent uh, virtual meeting of Czech schools happened in uh, June 2021, and an in-person conference is planned for summer 2022 in Chicago. Um, the, uh, the, there was also a uh, uh, online um, idea exchange uh, event for Czech schools in the United States and Canada in 2020 that brought together 140 participants. In fact, it seems that the pandemic uh, has basically facilitated um, these large meetings over Zoom um, and um, a, lot of, uh, a lot of interaction. This event also showcased steady support from the Ministry of International Affairs of the Czech Republic, Czech embassies in the US and Canada, and collaboration with Czech universities. On the broader front, there is also a well-organized initiative supporting the passage of the bill that would make voting by Czech citizens living abroad easier. And so the links that I have here, they would bring you to the sources on all these um, uh, wonderful things that are happening. So Czechs in America. Uh, they began to arrive to America in the second half of the 17th century as North America became one of the destinations for non-Catholic Christians seeking refuge from religious persecution in the Habsburg monarchy after the Thirty Years' War. The first major emigration uh, waves uh, beginning in the mid-19th century brought over uh, uh, poor peasants, rural craftsmen, laborers, small farmers, particularly from northeastern Bohemia and northeastern Moravia, as well as free thinkers and post-1848 uh, political refugees. Emigration of Czechs to America took form of chain migration as families and neighbors followed the first pioneers from their hometowns to often newly built settlements overseas. Nearly 400,000 Bohemians and Moravians came to the United States between 1850 and 1950. The influx slowed after the birth of the Czechoslovak Republic in 1918 and was further curtailed by the US Quota Acts in the 1920s, which had the biggest impact on Southern and Eastern European countries. 
The most recent U.S. Census reports 1.7 million Americans claiming Czech or Czechoslovakian ancestry. The strongest years uh, of American Czech um, span from, uh, I think I wanted to show you this map. This is where they went, but you already saw it in the numbers also. Um, the strongest uh, years of American Czech span from the 1890s through the 1930s. The number of actual Czech speakers in America has been difficult to estimate. Uh, there may be over 47,000 uh, Czech speakers today, but this number is too broad to represent the remaining speakers of the historic Czech diaspora in the US. So now that we know a little bit about moving to the United States, then um, building a new home in Texas. While the district chain migration to Texas from the impoverished Moravian and Bohemian regions of Austria and then Austro-Hungary began in the 1850s, the major emigration waves fall between the 1870s and 1920s. Uh, first Czechs began to settle in Texas in 1847. Most settlements were built within the Dallas, Houston, and San Antonio Triangle, reaching south to Corpus Christi area, many in the proximity to those already built by Germans. Up to 80% of Czech Moravians in the state were Catholic, and being a Catholic or a Protestant has remained an important aspect of Texas Czech uh, identity to this day. The settlers built uh, their own churches, schools, dance halls, and fraternal, religious, and theatrical organizations. They patronized they or their own businesses, stores, and pubs, and published their own newspapers. Among about 30 Czech periodicals published in Texas before World War II was also Nashinets, uh, that is the la last, uh, that is the long la longest lasting, really, uh, Czech language newspaper in Texas that was published in, in, uh, in Texas from 1914 to 2018. Uh, as for Czech speakers in Texas, the 2010 census records ab about 8,700 of them out of 136,000 persons of Czech and Czechoslovak. Again, we don't know how many of these are self-identified diasporic speakers. So the making of a diasporic language, how does that happen? So language maintenance in the Czech diaspora has been affected by the usual sociolinguistic factors such as location, being insulated or permeable, community relations, family customs such as uh, gradual acceptance of intermarriage, feasibility of intergenerational language transmission, age of the community, religious reg religion, of course, types of employment, and access to heritage language education. Even so, while the cards tend to be stacked against the diasporic variety from the beginning, the Czech diaspora occasionally evidences non-Czechs who learned the local variety by living and working around Czechs, including African Americans working on Texas Czech farms. So uh, Texas Czech uh, is then a critically endangered diasporic variety of Czech. It is a blend of archaic Eastern Moravian dialects, especially those from the northern or Valachian uh, region or subgroup, and Silesian or Lachian dialects, especially from the French Dutch subgroup, as you see these uh, mark on the map, uh, with traces of Central Moravian uh, from the Hana region that would be I could point, but yeah, it would be around here. But most of them came from that end. Uh, and, uh, and, also, and um, also from uh, uh, southwestern, uh, no, northeastern Bohemian and then southwestern Bohemian dialects as well. And then they are also mixed, of course, these dialects with the school Czech and with English spoken in Texas. Uh, compared to uh, other this is a different map, and it's based on research done. Uh, the research was based on uh, collecting the tombstone uh, or looking at the tombstone inscriptions in various communities and identifying the locations. Compared to other American Czech varieties, such as those in Minnesota, Nebraska, and Kansas, or Wisconsin, uh, Texas Czech is unique in that the dialect concentration in its baseline overwhelmingly originates in Eastern Moravia and Silesia. Uh, like uh, other minority languages, 
Uh, Texas Czech is marked by a shift toward a dominant language, a divergent grammar, and very limited use. In the process of language shift, three major processes we may call deceleration, acceleration, and attrition in contact are at play. We see these processes at work across all diasporic language varieties. In Texas Czech, deceleration in isolation has aided retention of some archaic dialectal features. Attrition in contact and incomplete acquisition have dramatically reshaped the immigrant baseline. And acceleration has nudged the, to the surface certain language changes that are progressing at a slower pace in the homeland Czech. To give a few examples for Texas Czech, with the slowing down of change, that is deceleration, Texas Czech has retained the archaic pluralis uh, respectivus to refer to family and other respected elders. So if you could just read the English translation. Tatinek hajdu oni měli farmu, so that oni is plural, měli is plural, and uh, referring to a singular person. So that's, uh, that's one of the things that uh, you don't find uh, on the territory of the Czech Republic anymore. Um, there are some other features, but just to give you one example. Acceleration, on the other hand, means that some tendencies that are already present in the source language tend to spread faster and wider through the contact language system, where standard Czech has negligible influence. So in Texas Czech, acceleration shows in the overuse of uh, pronominal subjects uh, uh, where Czech doesn't need them and English does. So uh, very possibly the, the influence of the, of the dominant language. Also in uh, the demonstrative, in the overuse of demonstrative determiners. So here you have an example like, ja taki odebiram ten nasinet. So uh, prefacing it with, uh, with that demonstrative determiner ten. Uh, so these tendencies exist on the territory of the Czech Republic, but they are much more pronounced than in the diasporic context. Language attrition in contact results in a reduced and reanalyzed version of the source language, such as you know, including blending in form, innovation, restructuring. Lone blends and calcs are almost the most obvious examples, among the most obvious examples. So we have some nouns here and hows, drugstore, pixak, verbs like tribovat, pikovat, hontovat, which would be to drive, to pick, to hunt, adjectives like brown and pink, which would be brownové, pinkové. Then also calcs, uh, uh, so loan translations uh, following, basically copying the or replicating the, the, the word order um, and the structure. Tetka udělají děcka topit, which is auntie will make the kids drink it. And loan shifts, uh, where you would, um, you have an example here. Moja sestra šla do České republiky, which is literally, she went on foot, where you actually need a more specific, uh, more specific verb, which would be to fly. Um, so these are just, just a very, just very, very few examples. These are also predictable different. There are also predict predictable differences in how different levels of the minority language respond to the pressures of asymmetrical language contact. So, lexicon, derivational morphology, pre-function morphemes such as conjunctions, prepositions, discourse markers, numerals, they go first. Um, they are less less stable. They are more permeable. While phonology, inflectional morphology, and other aspects of morphosyntax, such as grammatical agreement, are more stable and less permeable. So how did the shift in the Texas Czech community happen? First, there is borrowing, which is nothing unusual and happens almost uh, among, among the healthy languages all the time. So in the Czech Republic, notebooky is notebooks, and it's like in Texas, boxy, which is boxes. In asymmetrical bilingualism, however, minority language speakers begin to shift um, toward the majority language, at which point additional morphosyntactic and phonological changes begin creeping in. At this point, borrowing becomes more of an imposition. That's the term of Van Koetzem, um, and I'll show you some references later on. Exceeding the need and beginning to affect core vocabulary as well. While prestige and need motivate both borrowing and imposition in asymmetrical situations, what is generally seen as enriching and tolerable and controllable for a healthy language in borrowing 
becomes an encroachment upon the weakening language system under imposition, not least because of shifting language ideologies and loyalties. By the 1900s, uh, Texas Czech uh, leaders' uh, pat uh, patriotic uh, calls for mother tongue maintenance gave into pragmatism by promoting Czech-English bilingualism. Between the 1920s and 1940s, the pressures of assimilation increased, further eroding in the spirit of what you have here, Čeština není nutná k živobytí, as I was also once told, Czech is not needed to make a living. Uh, the prestige and communicative value of immigrant Czech, which spelled the end of uh, intergenerational language transmission in Texas Czech households after World War II. Younger generations began leaving family farms and intermarriage still rare through the 1920s became commonplace. The language incompletely acquired during childhood, further sidelined by a monolingual language policy in schools, continued to recede with fast diminishing, diminishing exposure in the family domain as the last bastion of life support. Moravian Czech, once linguistically and socially dominant within a remarkably resilient and self-sufficient community, was forced to abandon relative isolation and gradually shifted under the pressure of intense contact with English, displaying the signs of systematic change, typical for endangered languages under the agency of the linguistically and socially dominant language. So this is the story that you could basically write or that would apply to any of those diasporic varieties. It's very, very similar. Um, so as far as shifting identities, um, first I'd like to briefly clarify the long adherence to that the long time adherence to regional identities among Texas Czechs uh, um, has an explanation. Just like most Slavic peoples in the 19th century Europe, Bohemians and Moravians lacked independence and therefore a concrete concept of national identity. The process of language standardization during the national revival period in the Czech lands was barely settled before Moravian and Bohemian uh, immigrants uh, began leaving for North America. That is why the first settlers and subsequent generations traced their origin to distinct dialectal regions and most continue to identify as Moravian-speaking Moravci, which is Moravians, or Texas Moravian-speaking Moravčinu, Moravian, through the late 1990s. They also didn't like the label Bohemians because of the connotation associated with the word Bohemian in English. Self-identifications as Texas Czechs prevalent today began to increase after the fall of the Iron Curtain. Even though the heyday of self-sufficient Czech Moravian communities is long gone, Texas Czechs continue to proudly affirm their Czechness at festivals, uh, church picnics, polka dances, genealogy workshops, heritage organization meetings. Um, also, did I view the clear? Here we have the classes, community language classes. Many cultural events are held at the Texas Czech Heritage and Cultural Center in Lagrange, complete with the Texas Czech Village, which is an open air museum a powerful statement um, to the, or testament to the community's collective heritage motivated efforts. Um, these events create spaces conducive to small talk exchanges in Texas Czech, such as greetings and teasing and uh, weather talk, various interjections. So if you again just follow the English, so the exchange could go like, jak se máš, jak starý pes, jak práca ide, pomalia furt, On je nejlepší, když spí, jej danečky, dobrý den, s pánem Bohem, zapršať by mělo. So basically the little tokens that they can insert and then uh, you know, express their, their identity. Such events are also conducive to singing with uh, Texas Czech bands and for the display of Czech slogans on baseball caps, t-shirts, buttons bumper stickers, and other merchandise. My personal favorite is made in America from Czech parts. <laughs> An early result of community efforts, the Czech endowment funded by Czechs and established at the University of Texas at Austin in 1915, assures that Czech continues to be taught. Czech is still taught at a com community college in Schlenberg and occasionally in community language classes at the TCHCC. Music and wearing costumes uh, imported or text check made in particular are enjoyable and convenient signifiers of ethnic belonging. Um, 
they are outward expressions of Texas Czechness, uh, meaningfully complementing resi residual contexts of ancestral language use. In my earlier work, I examined the symbolic or emblematic and situational dimensions of Texas Czech identity, suggesting that any measures of authenticity are irrelevant to the dynamics of ethnicity, as the generations in such diasporic communities continuously recreate and adapt their sense of ethnic belonging to maintain the symbolic boundaries of their community. Understanding of ambiguity, uh, fluidity, and hybridity of any social identification in context is nothing new. The symbolic or emblematic and the situational dimensions express the fact that displaying certain identities when the occasion calls for it conveniently satisfies one's conscious and intentional longing for belonging and is a matter of one's choice. Fishman's classic definition of ethnicity as a continuity of being, doing, and knowing makes it possible to name and explore the disconnect between ethnic doing and ethnic knowing in such communities. Um, also, uh, seeing language in ethnicity reflects its diminishing role as a crucial criterion for the shaping of ethnic identity. In an immigrant community like that of Texas Czechs, having the language is no longer essential to ethnic self-identification. Yet both the idea of the group and the idea of having the heritage language which one does not need to speak in order to be self or other identified as a true Czech continues to help maintain symbolic uh, community boundaries. In summary, intentionality, conscious reflection, and its voluntary nature are the main ingredients of emblematic ethnicity. And the situational dimension draws our attention to the performative aspects of identity and to its participatory nature, dependent on the context uh, which brings it to life. The intersection of symbolic and situational, relying on the idea of language rather than the actual use, underscored by the meaningful communal and familial ties forged through generations, appears to be the best way to describe Texas Czech identity. So that's my wonderful Texas Czechs. Now, just a few words on this important topic uh, to conclude. So a simple Google search tells us that there are roughly 6,500 spoken languages in the world today, and that about 2,000 of those languages have fewer than 1,000 speakers. The Living Tongue Institute uh, for Endangered Languages estimates that nearly half of these world languages with the most endangered areas being identified as language hotspots is expected to vanish by the year 2100, um, causing a devastating loss to biolinguistic bio diversity and human knowledge. Saving linguistic diversity is not just a problem for linguists to resolve, nor does studying endangered languages merely satisfy our scientific interest. Caring for our languages as much as we care for our planet that is caring more on both fronts means sustaining sociolinguistic diversity, which in turn makes our species both stronger and smarter. Therefore, we must continue to document languages that cannot be saved and work to reverse shift where there's still a chance and community will to do it. In the context of these, lo in the context of these losses, a challenging question pertaining to immigrant languages is, does the existence of a healthy language elsewhere make losing its far removed variety any more acceptable? Our answer to this question is unlikely to make a difference for the languages of uh, languages to the in these in the historical Czech diaspora, but it can make a difference to language maintenance among the new wave of Czechs living abroad. Um, one last thing I I well, I have participated in some of these uh, debates with the politicians, uh, Czech politicians, uh, uh, during as, as the organizers were running the Zoom sessions on the, you know, the voting rights for Czech citizens abroad. Basically, just making it a little bit more convenient so that people actually can vote. And uh, so during the time, some some of those politicians voiced things like, you know. Um, uh, the perception of, of Czechs living abroad is that they are not Czech enough, you know, that they are traitors. And, uh, and so as I was thinking about it, I was thinking that uh, bringing, uh, bringing the understanding of the formation and history of the Czech diaspora uh, uh, could actually start in schools, 
which is not not a novel thing. I mean, it's quite obvious, really. But that incorporating this into the curriculum, uh, where in schools, the schools are already in business of educating Czech, European, and global citizens, uh, might, be, might be a good idea. Uh, that is not going to help save these Fargan communities again, but can we can learn from history for a better future about the language, community, identity, and perseverance in adversity. We can promote support and celebrate Czech at home and around the world because we do have a great advantage over the 19th century immigrants. We have open borders, we have transnational mobility, and we have a wide array of ways of staying connected. Thank you. Here are the references. Here's a thank you slide. So we'll, we'll turn to okay. the discussants and... Uh, you need to finish it, I think. So would you like to start uh, um, this, the, uh, your comments and, and questions? Yeah. Sure. Uh, I should start? Okay. So uh, first of all, thanks very much for these uh, really interesting presentations. Um, and. I, I had a lot of thoughts when I was listening to them, and uh, some of them, I think, uh, connect to each other, but mostly I think the, the papers are, or the presentations stand alone uh, in many respects and have interesting uh, problems connected to them. And um, for Václav, I was wondering, uh, first of all, whether one of the, you said that you didn't want to deal with the cybernetic aspects in terms of machines or computers. Um, by the same token, I'm wondering if um, the the focus on language implies that um, humans can be kind of programmed, <laughs> and uh, what you know in, in terms of when they see these associations, that they will somehow pick them up and integrate them, and then you know that they will run this new program, if you will. I mean, that disinformation works with some kind of program, uh, understanding of humans as reprogrammable on, in some respects. And I'm wondering if, you know, like, uh, how do you see language as a, <laughs> as programming language, or do you see language as, as code, <laughs> in yeah. some respects, for uh, reprogramming? Uh, the psyche, and what you know, if so, like what what are the uh, what are the uh, f fault lines or uh, discussions about how to counter disinformation? If uh, if disinformation aims at reprogramming, is the aim then to not be programmable, <laughs> or is it the aim to counter program, um, or uh, what what is it if um, if it's if if it's framed in those terms? Um, I also wondered whether size matters for the purposes of cybersecurity. Um, Czech Republic is a, a relatively small country. It's also a smaller linguistic space. Mm -hmm. and um, But you also mentioned that there's a lot of movement across contexts. The translation goes from English, and it happens very fast in multiple contexts. How does one think about uh, security in the, con in the context of something that's already and intentionally global? How does one see you know, like uh, what what aspects are aimed at uh, at a specific national target. For example, you showed the map of how Czech Republic is on this kind of, you know, cusp. Uh, so how does one know when it's kind of general, you know, everybody's getting it um, and it's kind of scattershot and how does one know when it's really uh, about Czech politics, especially uh, when um, they don't, you said, talk about local news items, they don't talk about the weather, they don't talk about, um, you know, bas baseball or basketball games, I'm assuming not baseball. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but do they interpret local news in light of mm -hmm. geopolitical issues, or do they make the local into the geopolitical, like vac in vaccination, for example, it gets very, very geopolitical very fast. And also, you know, we've seen instances like with um, Macedonia, but also with uh, Russia as a not very militarily advanced state, nonetheless being very successful with uh, cyber activity um, on, a ver on a relatively, one presumes, um, low budget. <laughs> and so are there opportunities for smaller states uh, in terms of 
Like, do you have to be big <laughs> in order to uh, think about these things for certain purposes? Because you have to have the research and computing capacity to analyze the data in, in real time, or does it, does it actually uh, help to be a bit smaller for some purposes? Um, also, I was interested in how, you know, that like this, these mis uh, disinformation campaigns, there's some kind of loopy logic within them. They're kind of like the protocols of the elders of Zion and that they, they outline a conspiracy and they are a conspiracy. And so you can't say, don't believe conspiracies, but believe this one, <laughs> you know, like, so how does one counter something that loops back in on the whole notion of conspiracy like this? Uh, in, in uh, so in some like um, rhetorical uh, realm, like what are the what are the strategies for um, thinking about uh, th uh, counter disinformation or uh, the various considerations in those regards? Like so, what is the next step after research such as as this? Um, also, there's something kind of intriguingly incoherent about. Like when you had the Bannon quote about flooding with shit, um, there's uh, there's something kind of seemingly almost, and I don't know if it's deliberate, but super incoherent about the messaging. So on the one hand, the virus is not a real thing. On the other hand, we have a vaccine, and our mm -hmm. vaccine is better than others, and we have the first vaccine. Um, on the one hand, states are bad because they get in the way of your life, but this state, happened, you know, like, and so there, there's there's no kind of consistent content within the messaging even though there are sort of clusters of issues around. And actually, it contradicts itself um, in, in many ways. And I was wondering um, in terms of, uh, and, and sometimes this contradiction seems to self-harm Russia, <laughs> like with vaccination, saying whether it's real or not, and, you know, like touting one's own vaccine. Like this, uh, this uh, you know, arguably came to bite a lot of, um, you know, the Russian population ultimately, which do, it's unclear how this serves a country that's already experiencing paranoid population decline. Um, and so um, I was wondering um, if its lack of coherence indicates like a, a kind of, you know, like that this is, this maybe isn't a strategy. It's, <laughs> it's, it's kind of multiple strategies in competition with one another, or that the, the, the competition is part of the strategy or the scattershotness of it is part of the strategy. I'd be keen to hear your thoughts on that. Um, uh, for Lidera's presentation, I really thought this was interesting. It made me think of some time that I spent with um, ethnic Hungarians in Novi Sad or in northern Serbia and in mm -hmm. Transylvania. And one of the observations that I made living among ethnic Hungarians in these areas is that, you know, they would make very strict rules about when two children would be mixing languages, they would stop them and say one or the other, but not both. Um, and they were also quite, you know, I was, I was really excited that the languages retained their integrity over centuries, really. Um, but on the inside, what that often looked like is incredible chauvinism. <laughs> you know, just real, um, uh, uh, really harsh attitudes towards anyone who was kind of out group. And it was this contrast whereby, you know, like the, and whereby the preservation of the language was cast in oftentimes very, um, uh, well, not to put it too fine a point on it, very chauvinistic terms, like that we're better than them and so we have to keep our language intact. And um, also there was a, another thing that was kind of a pattern and that was uh, this sense that some form of persecution was not necessarily a bad thing <laughs> because this sense of being on the defensive like helped uh, the preservation of language. Mm -hmm. um, and I actually heard a journalist in Hungary uh, say, you know, heaven forbid the Serbian state should ever like really just let us do <laughs> have our schools and, you know, our newspapers and not bother us, you know, like, um, and th this would be the end of the Hungarian community in Serbia, mm -hmm. uh, something along those lines. And um, so that there's some sense where, you know, where friction is kind of like, um, you know, conceived uh, for some purposes as necessary in order not to lose consciousness, like not to sort of uh, slip into, you know, like uh, bi bilingualism that then becomes, you know, like a different monolingualism. <laughs> um, 
Um, and, uh, you know, like the, in, within this community, people were quite critical of people who slipped, you know, a little bit out of it. And this was another way of kind of keeping these boundaries. And in, in the context of a world in which, you know, like oftentimes the politics of preservationism of things, it, you know, like in Hungary now, for example, this embattled sense that there are, you know, kind of enemies all around and we have to keep immigrants out so that we keep our language intact. Um, you know, I, I'm wondering if there's a way to, th you know, to think differently, but also practically about retaining the di uh, the diversity of small languages, because oftentimes the concrete manifestation of it is, you know, like not pretty. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so, are are there ways to think about it? Like you, you said, in some respects, interconnection is great. In other respects, interconnection doesn't necessarily help to maintain linguistic integrity because it you know encourages mixing like on chat channels and you know like um you know things get can get watered down in those uh mixes as well but is there a way to think about retaining diversification a diversified linguistic biosphere i can't remember the word you used it was great <laughs> um without you know like um uh, or in in a different key for example uh both in terms of like um the, the politics of it and the, the mood um, of it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Should I go or let them respond? Uh, I'll try and be brief, and then we'll have time for Q&A afterwards. Um, uh, so I do see the papers as connected, and I think that, to me, the unifying principle is uh, a focus on, on the Czech Republic and on Czech identity as being under serious threat. And the, the vectors are different, but the, the unifying principle is that, the, is that Czech identity, Czech culture, what it means to be a Czech is under threat. And I, would, I, would, I don't think it's hyperbole to say it's almost genocidal threat. I mean, if you do the numbers and if you look at Lita's paper and where it's headed, <clears throat> if in 85 years nobody speaks Czech, that, that, that means the equivalent of, of a kind of genocide. There are no more Czechs. If no one's speaking Czech, there are no more Czechs, period. Um, so I, let me put that not, uh, not quite so dramatically, but say that's at least a possibility to the extent that we associate identity um, with language in a fundamental way. Then if no one's speaking the language, then there is no identity. Um, and, then, and then Vaslov's paper uh, uh, has a different kind of vector, which is much more sort of narrowly uh, political, but again, putting Czech identity and um, what it means to be a Czech under threat. Um, so let me just, just quickly review just a few comments, I think. So Vaslov's paper highlights Czech political space under attack by a systematic campaign of disinformation by the Russian Federation. You could see this as, to use a hackneyed um, metaphor, the canary in the coal mine. Um, uh, as Lita points out toward the end of her paper, the Czech Republic isn't just the Czech Republic. It's a representative of all of us. We are all the Czech Republic in some way. And this could be the beginning of a series of, um, of threats that other nations have faced. For example, most North Americans are really familiar with the fact that a serious Russian disinformation campaign helped put Donald J. Trump uh, uh, into the presidency in 2016. And that you know, a lot of my students would debate uh, about when it was that cyber attacks actually resulted in the first human fatality. And usually it's cited that a woman in Germany who was getting ready for surgery, um, her, her surgery was delayed because of a ransomware attack and as a result, she died before she could get the surgery that would save her life. But I would submit to you that at least a third of the U.S. COVID deaths uh, uh, are due to misinformation and disinformation, some of which is a deliberate and systematic campaign of the Russian Federation. They're very, very good at it. Uh, and they find Americans a, a fat target. So the Czech Republic and the United States both share that they have been the, the uh, targets of these campaigns. I would say that this is putting it in some context of Russian foreign policy since Putin's rise to power, uh, it's been characterized by mainly negative foreign policy objectives. Uh, and when I think about that, I think of Putin should hear from my mother. You know, when I was young, she used to admonish me. She'd say, Ivan, uh, if you want to feel better about yourself, you should go out and do something to be proud of rather than put other people down. Uh, but Russia's foreign policy has been exactly that. It, it's limited by hyper-corruption um, uh, from a positive program of increasing its power. So it's found cheap measures to essentially weaken all of its possible adversaries. And its two big targets, no surprise, are the European Union, uh, which is an economic major economic competitor, and then NATO. 
and its use of disinformation, misinformation, and cyber attacks that, that, that use text and language have been creative and been highly effective in weakening both of those rivals. To the extent that they're weakened without having to reform at all, Putin's Russia becomes, by, by default, more powerful and more influential. Um, so that's been sort of Russian uh, foreign policy. Um, a couple of questions just methodologically is that when, in Russia's disinformation attacks against the United States, they use a lot of images mm -hmm. along with text. So we could consider memes. How would your methodology, um, which is really text discourse analysis based, how would it incorporate the use of imagery, the use of symbols that aren't encoded into text as part of that? Do they enhance? You know, that, that's sort of just a methodological question. And um, also on a more hopefully positive note, um, neither, of, neither you or, or Lita had any good news at the end, really. Um, moving beyond identifying um, uh, attacks by Russia against the Czech Republic, um, is there a strategy to counter Russian disinformation? I mean, Estonia has a couple of, um, it's a small state with a fairly small linguistic footprint, but they've pioneered some, since 2007, some pretty good um, counter disinformation campaign methods. So is Ukraine. Ukraine has its own um, television network, which has a sort of almost a game show every night where they, they highlight Russian disinformation and then out it. So I'm wondering if, if the Czech Republic could either adopt or innovate uh, and use some of your methods to actually um, identify and then target and counter that. Um, could the, your linguistic analysis method be used to train uh, an AI, an artificial intelligence, to both cheaply identify disinformation uh, in the way that AIs are now being used to tra and trained to identify deep fakes? So deep fakes are another form of attack where um, uh, somebody's appearance or, or voice are very carefully um, um, cloned or duplicated in a way that makes it more and more difficult for humans to tell the difference between the fake and the real. Uh, and that technology is accelerating. And I'm wondering if your, tech, your, your methods could actually be used to train AIs to do the same thing, which would be really exciting uh, because it would be a, a cheap countermeasure to Russian attacks. Um, Lita's paper details an ongoing threat to the Czech language and by extension Czech identity and culture. I see this as a more fundamental threat than disinformation. Uh, but it's not the only. It's only the, not only the Czech Republic that would lose if Czech language becomes extinct. To the extent, and this is a big debate in philosophy forever, to the extent that diversity of language and diversity of thought are linked, the extension of Czech language leaves us with one less way to identify and solve problems that affect all of us as humans. Uh, for example, climate change. I think if we're going to solve that, we're going to need to solve that as humans. No single country has uh, has the solution to that. And the more diversity of thought we have the more likely we are to innovate a way to save our species and uh, a lot of species connected to us from extinction. And that's, that's a critical issue. Um, I would compare the, lang the threat of language loss through globalization, um, which has been accelerated and intensified by internet interaction, to the problem of monoculture and large-scale agriculture. Um, monoculture facilitates some short-term efficiencies at the cost of long-term destruction of soil and the need to treat crops with powerful chemicals to protect from bio threats and facilitate growth. In linguistic terms, monoculture facilitates concentrating short-term profits for internet platforms at the long-term cost of destroying global intellectual capital and resilience. Um, so for you, Lita, more, what strategies might we employ to halt the loss of linguistic diversity? I know in one of your papers of yours that I read, and you touched on a little bit in your talk, um, there can be concerted efforts to slow, to, to halt language loss like this. Um, and could, could we turn the medium that's currently accelerating that loss, uh, let's say interaction in cyberspace, which is currently mediated by English-centric platforms like Facebook, could we figure out a way to deploy those to stop and then preserve linguistic and thought diversity? And I'll just close with that. Okay. Um, thank you for your cues. I don't know if I have A's. <laughs> 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 Uh, mm, so, you know, um, first, the, the, the all this question about the programming, um, I mean, that's that's a concept which is being dealt by several uh, linguistic theories. In corpus linguistic, we use the term lexical or any priming, that, that we are primed to do something or to, to hear something in cognitive linguistics. Uh, we also, you know, have the concept of prototype. And, it, you know, 
it in a sense works in this in this topic and in in general language as well so for example if i say on one hand you you would be primed to hear that that there's somewhere on the other hand also mm -hmm. and uh in in this sense uh systematic co-occurrence of associations uh primes us to view a concept with this association so if you're uh an um a uh, regular reader of anti-system media portals, you might um, be prone to interpret immigration as illegal because that's you know you know the priming that that they that they actually do. So any any migrant any migra migration is illegal, and uh, this is you know just just one case uh, which is really visible, but there are perhaps more of them underneath which we acquire by reading the text and we did, do not even know about it. So yes, um, in a sense, and if, um, if we focus on, for example, Facebook um, groups and Facebook posts of groups which are, you know, frequently sharing the content of anti-system media, and if you analyze the post, you'll find out that they actually um, uh, they uh, repeat some of the, the the primings and they they use it in in their own in their own expression. So that's that's one thing. And a related question, which was uh, posed by both of you, how to counter this information and if if the method can actually help to to uh, build some counteractions. Um, I'm not sure <laughs> at the time being. Uh, what we do is that. <laughs> Okay, the, the, the major problem is that we cannot say for sure that something is disinformation. We just, we can just simply state that something in anti-system is framed completely different from what we would expect in the mainstream. And that's, you know, uh, uh, an, an alert, you know, that, that's something that, you know, should uh gives you uh you know draws your attention to to the problem because there's something there's something going on so if, if for example um uh, the, the the migration is uh, more connected to dublin negotiations this, these are the quotas in eu in the anti-system media it means something it actually means that they want to um, they want to propagate this topic and this relation between EU as something uh, sponsoring or organizing the migration and so on. So um, the only thing how can we counter disinformation is to expose them and to uh, let the people be aware of them. So that, that's the only mm. thing. But, you know, the, the problem is how can we identify what disinformation actually is? Because, you know... That's that's um, that's a scale, and we can only say that something is different, you know, mainstream and anti-system. Mm. Um, uh, as far as the global and domestic agenda, um, there are of course some uh, nation-specific topics in in anti-system media. Uh, the specific situation in Czech is that there is also. Um, um, web portal which is officially financed by Russian government it's called Sputnik News that's similar to the vaccine but it's not, no connection there Sputnik News and this uh, portal actually broadcasts in many languages not just Czech and it's officially owned by Russian government and so on so uh, this is this is just one portal that you know um, tries to um, represent the, the, the Russian discourse in, in Czech but the other portals often clone text from Sputnik. Uh, they they, they uh, reproduce their, their you know, uh, points of view. But they also include domestic issues, especially when they are related to these you know, uh, global or geopolitical ones. So there are some domestic issues, but uh, only when it you know, helps promoting the, the the global ones i that that's my point of view i don't know if marco can can add something but uh, my point of view that this is the major strategy and uh, as far as the conspiracies and the loop within them that's a, that's a tough one that's a tough question and um i was lucky that that, that i've been in touch with my colleagues in the faculty of arts who are involved in the religious studies and they perceive all the conspiracy 
uh, business, or the business around conspiracies, as a manifestation of some religious, actually, uh, or they, they call it conspirituality, huh. because it has something in common. And the, 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 one of the points, uh, one of the key points here is that you cannot argue against uh, one's spirituality because that's, you know, uh, a logic proof situation. You, you know, that, that, that's something you cannot win. <laughs> And so uh, there is this idea, I'm not sure if it will work, but, you know, um, it is better not to counter disinformation like from the positions of logic, but uh, from positions of uh, uh, a similar spirituality. So uh, in a sense, it works better if someone says, I understand your feelings, I have the same one because I believe, I don't know, in... Um, this uh, particular thing, and uh, uh, so it, it, in a sense, it might uh, be a better way how to um, uh, how to counter the disinformation. Yeah, but yeah, it it, it has uh, some some uh, features of of, of um, spirituality, and a related question is to the the Steve Bannon's quote. Mm. You know, the, 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 the contradictory of it. I think one way to look at the stories produced by anti-system is to look at it as uh, evo uh, evolution in, in you know, uh, evolutionary process. I assume, I don't know how the infrastructure actually works, but let's assume that they create, I don't know, 100 stories and they let them live in the discourse and one of them is actually successful because it rings the bell for for many readers and the nine nine and ninety nine of them die out because they were not successful and uh, so uh, it might be the case that they are contradictory because you know it it worked so they do not um, I mean the, the anti-system media probably do not uh, control over the consistency of the, the content they actually produce. They control only uh, what, is, uh, uh, w w what is effective, how it works, if it's shared, if it's liked, if there are interactions on Facebook and, and, and Twitter and so on. So it does not really matter that it contradicts to what we've said yesterday. If it works, then it's okay. And that's the case of, of uh, actually the vaccination, because it was not a problem. COVID was not a problem. Then there was this phase in which uh, they said, we have the va vaccine. So in a, in a sense, they had to admit that it is a problem. And, and, and then again, uh, when we, I mean, the Czech Republic decided not to use uh, Sputnik as a vaccine, then, then it was not a problem again. So nowadays, they are still anti-bearing masks and so on. So that, that this is this is going on. Um, as for the uh, Ivan's uh, questions uh, specifically, um, we've seen uh, the, uh, the 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 spread of, of the disinformation portals is in last decade. It's basically uh, since uh, Russia invaded uh, Crimea. Mm -hmm. So that that was the, that was the moment in which we've. Uh, seen uh, uh, many many of them uh, begin to to function and and spread. Um, some of them are known to be financed uh, by Russian government. Uh, some of them are maybe you know just volunteers. Of, I don't know whom, but they are usually anonymous, so we cannot know for sure. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Interestingly, uh, we do not have as many um, Chinese propaganda pages. Uh, I, I know only of, of one, uh, which is broadcasting in Czech. It's like a CRI, China Radio International, I think. Uh, and that's the only um, similar, similarly oriented page uh, of, of Chinese, so to say, origin. Uh, yeah. Um, Images, yeah, that's a problem. And uh, to be honest, at the time being, we um, are, we cannot do anything about images, but that's definitely a, a complement 
to our analysis, mm -hmm. which is text-based, as, as you mentioned, and it should be uh, definitely something uh, worth um, trying or worth finding someone who's capable of this analysis because uh, I'm, I'm not I'm not capable of, of doing this as Marcos better in this perhaps <laughs> but yes definitely and I, I, I think that in case of uh, the Russia collusion with uh, the 2016 election it was uh, more pronounced in the in the social networks than it is as I see it in the Czech, uh, in the Czech disinformation, you know, niveau. Right, right. Um, yeah, and that's that's uh, the, the the major question. I can answer whatever you like further, but let's uh, let Lida to answer. Well, I'll be really brief. <laughs> Hope. Uh, I just I just wanted to ask. Uh, as far as the um, the Nabi Sad community, would you would you know uh, what generation? How long ago was it? Was it was it actually the language being transmitted within the family? Yeah, yeah, and um, I mean these were Hungarians who had been in this region for mm -hmm. hundreds of years, mm -hmm. and so yeah. Um, uh, some in some respects are tough to this, I guess. It's interesting. I wonder if it might be because the parents really get impatient with the children. <laughs> uh, it, it's 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 um, you know ultimately what I'm trying to say is ultimately the kids decide, and so that's the issue that the community language schools have a, the biggest problem with, right? So uh, the parents bring the children to school. Uh, maybe you know f through the, like the maybe the middle school and once once uh, they are high schoolers you know they they just say no more that's it I'm not doing it and that's where it stops so uh, there are definitely uh, less isolationist or friction free uh, strategies for doing this like you know one parent one language strategy or you can have one context and uh, one language kind of strategy and now I'm thinking about all kinds of wonderful resources that the, like when I was raising my, my boys um, and wanted to uh, have them, you know, wanted them to speak Czech, I did not have access to all the kind of resources that you can so easily have now. So mm. uh, I don't know why those parents would feel the way they did, because it's, it's very, uh, very possible. Now, as far as that them and us kind of, uh, contrasting, then that definitely was um, an issue uh, in Texas, and the oldest generations will still think about it and tell me about it. So, so uh, you know, Americans would not be, you know, they would not be doing things right. We were doing things right. You know, Germans are getting on our nerves all the time. You know, and so <laughs> don't associate with them. So, um, you know, they would comment on the yards, you know, who had better yards and things like that. <laughs> so it's, it's just, it's, it's uh, definitely, definitely it was, uh, you know, Americani, Americans, and then, you know, it was them. T these days, it really does not seem to be, you know, uh, that much of an issue. They're just proud that they have these exact borders, you know, that, uh, that, 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 that that's how that identity, then the Czech identity. Uh, um, you know, became more defined, you know, from all these regions that, uh, that they came from. And, uh, you know, just put it on, put on that identity when the time is right for it, right? So, um, uh, it, I, I guess I, I would need to know a little bit more about, I need to look into it to see, uh, you know, what the numbers and what's available in those communities and things like that. Um, and, um, um, as far as what could be done, that was, I think, Ivan's question. Uh, so, so it's 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 really uh, it boils down to the community will and wish. And if they don't wish it, then the linguists cannot do anything about it. So you know, having some design something and come into the community and say hey, throw the money at them and say, we are going to do this, you know, we have a grant, we need to, you know, produce teaching materials, this is what we are doing. It's not going to happen. Mm. So, so uh, 
you know, it would have to be, again, grassroots from the, within the community, uh, younger people in these heritage organizations, or just basically maybe forward-looking thinking. So let's, let's orient our activities a little bit more toward language, you know, from, I don't know, um, um, electing the Czech and Slovak queen, you know, parading in costumes, maybe we just need to spend a little bit of time on, 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 on the language itself. So utility is really central to it. And, and I know that, uh, you know, these, say these cooking classes and things like that, that's really like learning from what, what's done in, the, in, uh, some, um, in uh, some tribal nations where they try to re revitalize the language, you know, that they have these apprenticeship programs and things like that. So, you know, those are useful community language classes, uh, but really that community will is at the center of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one thing the Hungarians have done lately is instituted a program that's sort of like Israel's, where you can repatriate yourself at mm -hmm. the expense of the state mm -hmm. <laughs> for mm -hmm. some period in order mm -hmm. to, um, which is, you know, it has its own, like, um, I mean, once again, this is, you know, this is Orban <laughs> and, and uh, you know, all that comes with it. Uh, but th this is an express effort uh, to get members of the diaspora to retain linguistic mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm, capacity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we sent, actually, Charles, I think, sends lecturers to Serbia as well, mm -hmm. uh, Czech, Czech students who are, uh, they are preparing to be teachers of, of Czech as a foreign language, and then they, you know, they go maybe for, a, for a six months or something, you know, to, mm -hmm. to Serbia as well to teach, um, but, but yeah. Well, um, I think we actually over over fulfilled our plan. <laughs> yeah. And so, uh, if, uh, if 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 we have any questions um, from the floor, thank you for staying so long, <laughs> everybody.